and I will go ahead and record. Okay. Um, this is an echo session, which we will get into in a little bit, but basically it's an interactive learning community. So feel free to have your webcam on, um, ask questions in the chat, and there will be time for discussion in our breakout groups. And finally, if you would like to rename yourself to your name, um, your site or organization where you're from, and your title, you can do that by clicking on the three dots uh, in the top of your picture, which I'm sure by now everyone knows after two years of Zoom world. And I will pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Hall Landy. Um, Dr. Hall Landy is a researcher and a psychologist with a specialty in early identification of developmental delays and disabilities. She leads our Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, um, also known as Min Adam, and also our Minnesota Act Early Project. She is also faculty in our Minnesota LEND program. Welcome, Dr. Hall Landy. Thank you, Courtney, for that nice introduction. And I also wanted to extend a warm welcome to everyone in our audience today. I'm seeing a lot of new faces around the state, as well as some familiar faces. So welcome to all of you. It's great to have you here. We will keep it interesting at this end of the day. And one thing I was saying early on is it's cloudy and dreary here on campus. Uh, so I'm hoping for some sunshine to come soon, but we'll try and keep it exciting <laughs> to give you a little boost at the end of the day. Um, again, it's nice to have all of you here today. My name is Dr. Jennifer Hall Landy. I am a researcher here on the University of Minnesota campus. I specialize in early identification of developmental delays and disabilities. All of us are at the Masonic Institute on the Developing Brain, a new site right on the River Road, the old Shriners Hospital. Hospital, uh, which we're hoping to eventually be able to open up to the community and have visitors here. Uh, but for now, you're, you're getting to hear us over Zoom. And I just want to give a brief introduction of Project SCOPE. SCOPE stands for, it's another acronym, I know we have many in our field, Supporting Children of the Opioid Epidemic. Um, our goal is to share resources, knowledge, a variety of speakers around the topic of neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal. Um, we developed this series, we, we had a, a series one last spring, and this is series two. There will be some similar content, but also a lot of new content as well. Uh, our focus group is early childhood providers and interventionists, but really we welcome everyone, family members, uh, self-advocates, uh, members of the community, everyone is welcome. And um, we love having the richness from all of these different disciplines and geographical areas. Um, um, while you may know a bit about the ECHO model, especially those of you that have been there with us um, before, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it. Uh, the ECHO model, it stands for Extension for Community Health Outcomes. I think it has a really interesting history. Now, now we all are over Zoom, so you're going to have to kind of go back in your time machine a little bit <laughs> prior to virtual content and Zoom being such a common part of our everyday lives. But the ECHO model was started by a specialist in New Mexico. Um, I will have his name next time. But he started it because he was centered around, I believe, the University of New Mexico and had a lot of specialized knowledge in liver disease. And what he was seeing was that due to lack of knowledge around the state in greater areas, the content and information wasn't getting out around his state. And our goal here today is not to, at the University of Minnesota, is not to hold knowledge and keep it here. It's not, shouldn't just be accessible for people on university campuses or urban areas. But we want to share what we know, the knowledge and expertise of our speakers, of our attendees, with everyone all around the state. We say that our goal here is to democratize healthcare knowledge and information. So a few of our key points, we promote health equity, we share knowledge and expertise, and we do expect this to be bi-directional. Um, we will have an array of wonderful speakers, but we also invite all of you to share your knowledge and experiences. We are, we are richer and better together um, in terms of knowledge and content. Our goal is also to reduce disparities and increase access, provide healthcare knowledge without barriers, 
bridge healthcare and education and really to develop this community of practice together. We're all learning together. The four principles of the ECHO model, technology to leverage scarce resources. This is that, this is still very innovative, but before they were, were doing this virtually, not many people were with the ECHO model. Um, we implement best practices to reduce disparity. We will have a family story where you, we will apply what we learned with the speaker to a story of a family, and we use data to monitor outcomes. Next slide. This is our first session. Again, thank you for coming to our first session. Um, this is an introduction to the opioid crisis. Next week, we'll be talking about developmental monitoring, child development, and early intervention, and some of the impacts of um, neonatal exposure to opioids through, I, I will be, spoiler alert, I will be the speaker that week. So um, it, it, I'm giving you just a hint of how exciting that will be with my introduction today. Uh, session three, we're gonna talk about ACEs, um, adverse childhood events. So weaving the understanding of ACEs, trauma and resilience for healing in indigenous communities. Session four, building recovery capital across the continuum. Session five, we're gonna have a new speaker on child welfare systems impact. And then the next sessions, um, we're doing a NAS and NOWS. Um, Rebecca, can you put some of those acronyms in the chat, please? And um, the neonatal abstinence syndrome and the neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, we're going to do a deeper dive on that with a neonatologist. And then sessions se seven and eight um, are yet to come. So it will be very exciting and wonderful. We just have yet to announce those. Uh, next slide, please. So our agenda for today, welcome and intros, which is I'm doing, and I see I'm already over on time. I'm going to introduce our wonderful speaker today, Liz Corey. Next, we'll have our family story. That is our applied time where we're going to talk about applying some of the knowledge with, with a family. Um, breakout groups, 345 to 355, and closing remarks, 355 to 4. Again, thank you for chatting your names in. Thank you for having your cameras on. Um, and we're excited to have all of you here. And with that, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. Welcome Liz Corey from the Minnesota Department of Health. And you have a beautiful bio that I am going to read here. Liz is an evaluator with the Injury and Violence Prevention section of the Minnesota Department of Health, working across several prevention topics, including overdose, adverse childhood experiences, intimate partner violence, and traumatic brain injury. Liz has her Master's of Public Health in Maternal and Child Health with a minor in Epidemiology, as well as a Bachelor's Degree in Sociology and Anthropology. Um, Liz also has a background in Mental Health Case Management, Food Security Advocacy, and Infectious Disease Surveillance. Welcome, Liz. We are happy to have you here today. And we are just going to hand it over to you to share your presentation. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Jennifer just said keep cameras on, but I might turn mine off just to make sure that my audio quality stays high. I feel like sometimes when I am presenting and I'm going through slides, the voice gets a little distorted. So I'm going to see if I can just pop my camera off here. Understandable. And you sound great, Liz, right now. Do just I? You know okay. Then maybe I'll leave it on. Maybe I'll okay. leave it on. Um, if ever it doesn't sound good, someone just like give me a wave or throw something in the chat and I will try to turn it off. So let me see if I can control the screen now. Yeah, there we go. There's my intro slide. Again, I'm Liz and I'm an evaluator with the Injury and Violence Prevention section at uh, the Minnesota Department of Health. So I'm hoping that by the end of our time together today, all of you will have an increased understanding of the history of the opioid crisis, a primer on some of the social determinants of health and substance use, and a general sense of the landscape of opioid use disorder and opioid overdose in Minnesota. Before we dive in, I want to take a few minutes to frame this conversation. So substance use disorder, including opioid use disorder, is a preventable and treatable chronic condition, just like diabetes and asthma. There isn't any shame or blame involved in these conditions, and substance use disorder does not occur in a vacuum and can impact anyone. So negative associations and feelings towards people who use drugs is what we refer to as stigma, and that can really lead to a lot of social isolation and barriers to accessing health care. And these um, increase vulnerability for drug overdose and other drug use related harms and decreases pathways to recovery resources when folks who are using drugs feel really stigmatized. 
So all that is to say is the language we use when we talk about substance use and people experiencing substance use disorder really matters and does make a huge difference. And we can each play a role in decreasing the stigma surrounding substance use by using first person language. Many of you on the call will be familiar with person first language, but it simply means acknowledging the humanity of an individual before defining them based on the health conditions that they experience. So some examples of first person language to incorporate into your vocabulary include person who uses drugs or a person who injects drugs, person recovery and person living with opioid use disorder. Some really common stigmatizing words and phrases to avoid are opioid abuse or drug abuser and addict. It's also really important to note that the language relating to substance use and misuse changes quickly. And the list of terms on this slide doesn't cover everything. So when working with people in communities impacted by substance use, it's the best practice to ask directly and to follow their lead on the language that they prefer to use when discussing substance use. I am not a person with substance use experience in my past, so I definitely am not an expert. All of these terms that I use have been informed by talking to our partners who are working in the field or people with lived experience. Just to set the stage here too with a couple more key terms and definitions. Um, so opioids refers to the class of drugs, both illicit and prescription medications that are um, within that. They're often prescribed after surgery or injury or really commonly to relieve cancer pain. It's one of the first uses of opioids. Common types of prescription opioids include oxycodone, otherwise known as oxycontin, hydrocodone, which is Vicodin, morphine, fentanyl, and methadone. Common types of illicit opioids are heroin and illicitly manufactured drugs that replicate the effects of those prescription opioids I just listed. Opioid misuse is the use of any opioid for a purpose not consistent with legal or medical guidelines. And then opioid use disorder or substance use disorder um, are really quite similar. That substance use disorder is the umbrella term re related to um, dependence on any substance or substances. Um, whereas a formal diagnosis of opioid dependence is also called opioid use disorder. So this slide is showing the injury pyramid, which we use a lot in injury and violence prevention work just to show the true scale of, of the opioid epidemic. So while death is the most profound impact and the one that we hear about the most in the news and in reports, there are many other harms associated with drug use. So death from overdose has become that most visible part of the injury, but death from overdose results not from a singular time of using substances, most likely. It's rather a representative of substance use pattern that's frequently rooted in pain, trauma, and suffering. And again, that substance use does not occur in a vacuum. So no one wakes up and decides to start having a substance use disorder or engage in risky use. So to illustrate this injury pyramid, um, I'll give an example of some of the numbers that we see. So for example, for every one opioid involved death at the top of that pyramid, there are two opioid related hospital admissions, four opioid related emergency room visits, seven opioid related EMS runs, and then 30 opioid related treatment admissions. So you can really see how at the bottom of that pyramid, we can think of that as that 30 treatment admissions and it just gets narrower and narrower as we go up to death with the counts getting smaller, but all of those numbers representing people who are loved and live full lives. So when we think about who's impacted by the opioid epidemic, we're thinking about everybody who has experienced pain, trauma, and suffering, or who may experience pain, trauma, and suffering, and everyone who knows works with or loves them. So it's really quite the understatement to say that everyone could be connected to or impacted by the opioid epidemic in some way, either directly or indirectly. So then the question becomes what creates the demand for altering substances in the first place? And below that diagnosable condition is that pain, trauma, and suffering, whether that's physical pain, emotional pain, psychological, or all of the above. I'm going to give a little brief history on the history of opioids or a little brief section on that. There are entire courses on this I'd be happy to connect you all with if you're interested, um, but this is just a little primer. So while opioids have been getting a lot of airtime in the media and policy attention in the last two decades, they've been widely used in the United States for over a century. Um, and the, the opioid crisis of the last two decades has really um, been influenced a lot by racialized policies. And I'll get into those just a little briefly here too. So some history of opioid use and regulation in the US. 
At the beginning of the 1900s, there was widespread heroin use across the United States and no federal regulations addressing the increased rates of heroin addiction. Doctors and pharmacists were able to prescribe heroin and other opioids at their own discretion. Y'all might have seen um, images floating around the internet of old cough syrup that has, you know, heroin, morphine, opium. It has all of these um, in, that, in that cough syrup that you could just buy from your pharmacist down the block. So in 1906, the federal government stepped in with some legislation requiring federal regulations, starting with the Pure Food and Drug. Act, which allowed the federal government to regulate medication prescribing, followed by the Harris and Narcotic Act in 1914, which tasked doctors and pharmacists for prescribing opioids. Very different from what we've seen in the most recent past where doctors and pharmacists were receiving some financial benefit for prescribing opioids. We can really see how a lot has changed in just the past 100 years. The first federal legislation criminalizing heroin passed in 1920, which increased to, became increasingly criminalized through new bills through the 1960s, including the landmark 1951 passage of federally mandatory minimum sentences for possession and sale of heroin. In 1971, U.S. President Richard Nixon publicly declared the national war on drugs and the establishment of the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA, followed very quickly in 1973 both of which ramped up U.S. efforts and spending to enforce drug law and increase the prosecution of both drug sales and possession. The war on drugs is widely accepted now as a racialized policy that disproportionately charged and incarcerated people of color who used or bought and sold substances, resulting in the disproportionate incarceration rates that we're seeing today. In 1986, the Reagan administration increased punitive law enforcement efforts focused on people who use drugs, establishing zero tolerance laws for any illicit drug possession. And in more recent history, federal funds under the Obama, Trump, and Biden administrations have been dedicated to a mixture of prevention efforts, including law enforcement, treatment services, and overdose emergency responses. I really like this slide to really to show just how in the last two decades the opioid epidemic has changed. I just went over like a little over a century of history, but um, we're in what would be called the third wave of the opioid epidemic right now. So from 1999 to 2019, nearly 500,000 people died from an overdose involving any opioid, including prescription and illicit opioids. And that rise can be shown on this slide in the three distinct waves. So the um, Wave one on the far left and that lighter blue began with increased prescribing of opioids in the 1990s with overdose deaths in involving prescription opioids increasing since at least 1993. The second wave began in 2010 with rapid increases in overdose deaths involving heroin. And the third wave began in 2013 and is where we are currently. And we've seen significant increases in overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids, particularly those involving illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And the market for illicitly manufactured fentanyl continues to change and it can be found in combination with really any sort of substance on the market right now, uh, but most commonly in heroin, counterfeit pills and cocaine. And it's important to note here too that many opioid involved overdose deaths also include other drugs and we will refer to that as multiple drug toxicity. But just as substance use doesn't occur in a vacuum, rarely are opioids the only substance being utilized as well. Can't have any conversation these days without talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the opioid crisis. And unfortunately, we've seen an increase in overdose deaths nationwide um, really related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Reasons for this include um, increased isolation, which again, all of us have felt, I'm sure. And um, going back to that injury pyramid, there's been a lot of pain, trauma, and suffering associated with the pandemic. And there's also been reduced access to treatment or support groups. Um, a lot of people find a lot of uh, support in going to in-person meetings, and that wasn't possible for a really long time. Or um, just reduced access to treatment in general with treatment centers needing to close due to COVID-19 outbreaks or um, all sorts of different reasons. As we all know, we all work in social services. There's been a lot of challenges to keeping the doors open to necessary services, especially in communities disproportionately impacted by the opioid crisis and COVID-19.
So this slide, um, I'd really encourage you all to just like take a deep breath and think about what I'm going to say. And if you feel any sort of like strong reaction to just sit with that as well, because this is something that is really important to talk about with the opioid crisis, but often not explicitly discussed. So until the early 2000s, the US popular media primarily associated use of illicit drugs with communities of color. So dating back um, to at least a century when I was mentioning how you could buy heroin and opium in a cough syrup, um, opium and opium dens were mainly presented as being present in Chinese immigrant communities. And those people were being arrested um, at much higher rates for having substances that were legal at the time. And media has long portrayed people who use drugs as ethnic minorities and people more likely to commit crimes, be violent, or to live in urban areas. And the crack epidemic of the 80s and 90s, which was a little before my time, um, but was portrayed as really primarily impacting communities of color, although we have the data to back up that crack and cocaine were being used primarily by uh, folks that identified as white. And there's been a substantial pooling of resources into opioid prevention and treatment through state and federal government sources and a noticeable shift in our culture to something as to view opioid addiction as something to be treated and viewed compassionately and again to stop using that word addiction now we're just referring it to as opioid use so this different perspective and approach to treatment rather than punishment and incarceration has surprised and really deeply saddened communities of color who did not receive that funding and attention um, that white communities and people who use drugs are receiving presently. There was a really large shift once um, the opioid crisis started impacting primarily white communities with a big outpouring of funds and um, communities of color who had been really treated quite horribly for the same sort of condition of opioid use disorder, substance use disorder, um, saw that and felt that and really have communicated in all sorts of different avenues that it's not equitable um, and that their, their concerns with substance use in their communities were largely ignored for decades and were in fact punished. So heroin and opioid use really is not new among communities of color, but yet many stories of successful recovery continue to highlight white people from rural areas who found themselves um, using opiates um, illicitly and following a prescription from a medical provider. So we can think about how um, when, we th when you think of who is impacted by the opioid crisis, I would really challenge you to think of who you picture and what has influenced that picture. So in the first wave of the opioid epidemic, um, like overdose deaths in the communities of color were definitely already occurring, but there wasn't any media coverage. So most people, when they do think of the opioid crisis now, are thinking of people, um, white people or people of middle class or upper class. And just to really think about how the media has portrayed that and how that sympathy and coverage was not available for communities of color. All right, I'm gonna just do another really brief primer of social determinants of health. Again, there are courses on this, master's programs, PhDs, all related to this. So this is gonna be really brief. Um, I'd recommend that if you want to dive in a little bit more for yourself to go onto the Healthy People website, I think they have a really nice description of different social determinants of health and how that's um, interacting with federal policy. But overall, health starts with where people live, learn, work, and play. Conditions of life are connected to healthy outcomes, especially when it comes to the treatment of chronic pain, mental health, and trauma. Social determinants of health are the conditions within a home, family, school, and community that all can impact a person's ability to be healthy. Social determinants of health include physical characteristics of the neighborhood a person lives in, access to healthy food, safe housing, quality education, their economic well-being, and many, many more. So the social determinants of health, which I've acron acronymized, is that a word? We're going to make it a word, into SDOH. Um, they could be grouped into five domains, so education, access, and quality, healthcare and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and economic stability. So while the social determinants of health can have a huge role in impacting a person's health and well-being and quality of life, they also have um, a similarly large impact on health disparities and inequities. So for example, people who don't have access to grocery stores with healthy foods are less likely to have good nutrition. And that raises their risk of health conditions like heart, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, and can lower their life expectancy.
An important social determinant of health that influences all of the factors I just listed above are, of course, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. And ACEs are significant social determinants of health that have been linked to an increased risk of mental health issues and substance use. ACEs are grouped into three categories shown here, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. ACEs are incredibly common nationwide and in Minnesota with an estimated 40% of Minnesota students experiencing at least one ACE. And we do see that there's a dose response with ACEs, meaning that the more that one has, the greater the risk of negative health outcomes. And there's also, an, in Minnesota at least, and definitely nationally, but um, an association between the number of ACEs one has and their race. So in Minnesota, students of color are far more likely to have multiple ACEs compared to white students. And that higher likelihood is closely connected to social determinants of health and racism. So when we think back to the entry pyramid I showed earlier to frame this conversation, we can place ACEs in the base of that pyramid as a form of pain and trauma and suffering, and a form of trauma that can have impacts across the lifespan. This is a busy slide, and I apologize for that. Um, I promise I'll break it down in the next one. But to tie together that social determinants of health and ACEs and substance use, we've created this social ecological model of substance use and overdose prevention. These social ecological models are also referred to as SEMs, are used to better understand the multiple different levels at which a person's health is impacted. So this model considers the complex interplay between individual, interpersonal community, and societal factors. Essentially, a social ecological model details some social determinants of health and how they influence and overlap with one another and show up in a person's life. So this social ecological model shows some of the potential to social determinants of health that may influence substance use, including a sense of personal safety, safe housing, supportive parents, a safe neighborhood to live in, and affordable health insurance, just really the tip of the iceberg. On this next slide, I'm going to trace how a societal factor could influence an individual's health. So we'll start at the far right, the societal level, which includes governments, institutions, and systemic racism. At this level, we might have legislation that supports syringe service programs, medically assisted treatment providers and services, and the expansion of behavioral health services. Legislation can only be created at the societal level by a government with authority over the geographic area. So let's say here that what we're looking at is an increased um, health insurance coverage for mental health care and substance use treatment. So moving to the left, down to the community level, we can trace how legislation that supports MAT providers and increased health insurance coverage could increase access to MAT in a community as more providers or clinics could be licensed to offer the service and more people might be insured by a policy that covers these services. At the interpersonal level, the acceptance of MAT, again, that's medication-assisted treatment, it can influence how the service is viewed and utilized by a social group. This interpersonal level includes friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, etc., all of whom can have an impact on a person's health-seeking behaviors. So lastly, at the individual level, the availability and acceptance of withdrawal symptom management using MAT can impact a person's likelihood of maintaining abstinence from substances. Without changes in legislation or health insurance coverage, improved access to MAT in the community, and acceptance by a person's social circle, they might not have been able to access MAT at all. And stigma towards people who use drugs does and can occur at all of these levels, including at the individual level through self-stigma and shame, hence why it's so important that substance use prevention work involves stigma reduction components and person-centered non-judgmental language. Now that we have that shared frame, and I understand that I went through that very quickly, and that's a lot, um, from which we can view this opioid data and consider how social determinants of health impact substance use, I'm going to share some data specific to Minnesota. So opioid data comes from a few different sources, but we primarily at the Department of Health use hospital discharge data and death records to help us better understand substance use and overdose trends. So this slide is showing that unfortunately non-fatal overdoses in our state are increasing and they've steadily increased since 2016 with a substantial increase from 2019 to 2020. And non-fatal overdoses have unfortunately increased nationally during the same time period as well. 
I'm going to put a link in the chat to our opioid dashboard before I forget so folks can look at that if they're interested. That's got a, it's got a lot of the graphs that I'm going to be sharing here today. Um, so you can bookmark that if it's something you'd like to go back to. And I will note before I keep diving in farther that you'll notice that a lot of this data does end in 2020. We have some preliminary data from 2021 that has shown this trend increasing and the rate of the increase going up as well. For a lot of reasons, the data isn't quite validated yet. Uh, of course, COVID-19 capacity has slowed some things down. And also it just takes time to really abstract medical records. So um, just to be clear about that, it's not that we don't have that data, it's just we're waiting on some of that. Um, finality. So preliminarily, statewide data is showing that drug overdose deaths have been increased as well. They increased 27% from 2019 to 2020, which represents 792 individual people up to 1,008 individual people who passed from an overdose. Compared to 2019, drug overdose deaths increased in March and peaked in May, with the second peak in August of 2020. In March of 2020, when the impacts of the pandemic first began, including Minnesota's first stay-at-home order, we saw the largest monthly increase of 64%, or 53 to 87 deaths, compared to 2019. The trend of each individual monthly drug overdose death total being higher than the previous year continued throughout all of 2020, which is represented on this slide as that green line. So we can just see how it kept ramping up compared to other years. Preliminary data also shows an increase in drug overdose deaths in both the seven county metro shown here by the green line and greater Minnesota, the purple line from 2019 to 2020 with a larger increase in the metro. Of course, we have to keep in mind here that the metro is the most populated part of our state um, and rates can be really helpful here to consider. And we do find that the rate of overdose can be much higher in greater Minnesota. But in the metro, drug overdose deaths increased 40% from 2019 to 2020, or 483 to 673 deaths. And in greater Minnesota, this increase was 21% increase was from 2019 to 2020, representing 276 deaths in 2019 to an increase of 335 deaths total in 2020. So those state rates and numbers really mask significant drug overdose disparities. In Minnesota, African American and indigenous populations are dying from drug overdose deaths at unequal rates compared to whites. In Minnesota, African American and indigenous people die of drug overdose races. Oh, I just lost my place. I'm so sorry, y'all. African, I had like a little typo in my speaker notes. African-American Minnesotans are two times more likely to die of a drug overdose than white Minnesotans, and indigenous people living in Minnesota are seven times more likely to die of an overdose than white Minnesotans. These differences in overdose rates among these communities of color are due to systemic oppression and inequitable access to the resources that people need to live a healthy life. The race rate disparities in drug overdose deaths mirror other racial disparities unfortunately seen in Minnesota, like those in graduation rates, infant mortality, poverty, incarceration, removal of children from the home, unemployment, home ownership, and suicide. So in Minnesota, those factors like systemic racism have prevented communities of color from having equal access to the resources needed to be healthy. Poverty, ACEs, intergenerational trauma, and intergenerational substance use are all social determinants of health influenced by systemic racism. The health inequities experienced by these communities of color as a result of social determinants do directly result in these disparities and are very preventable. The mortality rate disparity Oh, I saw this question. Any reason why down between 2017 and 2018? That's a great question, April. Um, there's a, quite a few different reasons why we might see a decrease. Um, it's hard to attribute causality, as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, but it could be that um, there was more access to treatment, there was change in health insurance coverage, um, change in prescribing rates. We have seen a downward trend in the, pres in the prescription of opioids since about 2015 when we've really started tracking that. Um, so lots of potential reasons. So unfortunately, disparities in overdose deaths have grown. Um, the mortality rate disparity between Indigenous and white people continued and in fact worsened in 2019. 
So from 2010 to 2019, the indigenous mortality rate from overdose almost tripled from 29 per 100,000 people to 80.7 per 100,000, which represents a 178% increase. During the same time period, the African-American mortality rate increased from 11.7 per 100,000 to 20.2 or a 73% increase and was still almost two times as high as the white mortality rate. So to wrap up, I have a few key messages to share with you all that I hope you can take with you and consider with this family story is in that substance use is preventable and influenced by many factors outside of an individual's control. Substance use can be treated and um, compassion and active destigmatization of substance use uh, is crucial to improving the health of all Minnesotans and keeping in mind that when we're thinking of parents, specifically and young children, that all parents want to be good parents and all parents love their children and substance use is not a choice that's made lightly and is often rooted in pain, trauma and suffering disproportionate among communities of color that have been experiencing pain, trauma and suffering at the hands of a patriarchal and um, colonizing culture for centuries. The opioid crisis has roots in racialized policies that do not treat everyone equitably. As public health professionals, we must consider how we can actively address inequity in the opioid crisis response. And social determinants of health and racism impact all aspects of health and disparities in social determinants of health are directly linked to increased risk of substance use, overdose, and barriers to accessing treatment. Oh, I went too far, sorry, sorry. That was the end of my slides. Again, my name is Liz. I've got my name and number on the slide here and I'll put my email in the chat. But I think we've maybe just got a couple minutes for questions before diving into that family story. Yeah, Liz, thank you so much. You shared a lot of data in a short period of time. So I would really encourage everyone to take a look at the data dashboard. Um, that is a wonderful resource. You know, I'm going to start off with a question, but I hope people can put their questions in chat. We have just a short bit. A couple things, Liz. I are there some new initiatives federally or statewide we should be watching for or think about for those of us interested, um, not just in this data, but but learning more, bringing resources to communities. And I guess as you think about this, a lot of our attendees today are early intervention providers or in early childhood. Um, anything they should be thinking about as well. So it's sort of a two-part question. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see, first and foremost, thinking about early childhood and like family home visiting, for example, there's been some recent change in Minnesota statute that as long as a mother um, is seeking treatment for a substance use, you don't need to report that. There's been a change to that mandated reporting law, which is really informed from an equity perspective. Because of course, we know that mothers of color were far more likely to be reported for things than white mothers and far more likely to have their children taken away. So I would encourage you to explore that change in statute and how that might relate to your practice. And then I'd also share that from a harm reduction perspective, um, anyone can carry naloxone, anyone can carry information on naloxone, um, fentanyl testing strips were recently, um, I don't want to say mandated, but allowed to be purchased using federal funds. And those are not illegal to possess or to share, um, as we are seeing that more substances are um, including fentanyl, which is highly, highly toxic. Um, if that's a, a piece of harm reduction you can build into your practice and have on offer for folks that you serve or in community spaces that you work, that's a really easy way to support people who use drugs and try to prevent overdose harm. Liz, that, that's really helpful information. Could you put, I, I want to be respectful of time. I see Courtney looking at me, Jennifer, stay on track. Um, but could you put a few links to those resources in the chat so that our audience can, can have a link to learn more about both? That, that was really helpful applied strategy. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Thank you for having me. Any other questions? Feel free to chat them in um, before we start our family story. And Liz, thank you for putting, oh. Um, there's, not, there's not a limit, no, as far as I know. It's not an illegal substance. Um, so something that we have seen a lot of confusion around is um, law enforcement officials will confiscate needles from injectable naloxone. We all hear about the ones that you spray into your nose, but there is an injectable type, and that's very legal to have too. It's not illegal to have those needles. Um, no limit. It's, um, it's not a... a criminalized substance in any way.
Thank you, Kat, for the question. Really helpful. And we'll watch for those resources in the chat. All right. And Liz, thank you for putting your contact information in the chat. I, I know sometimes for me, I listen and process and then um, follow up. So 